chances are you hear the word mag- medieval magic. <laughs> the image of a witch springs to mind. Wise and wizened old crones huddling over a cauldron containing unspeakable ingredients such as I for newt. You think people brutally prosecuted by the zealous priests, but this picture is inaccurate. To, the, to, to begin with, fear of witchcraft, selling one's soul to demons to afflict harm on others, was more of an un, um, early mon, modern phenomenon than an evil one. Only beginning to take hold in Europe on the tail of the not 15th century. This vision also clouds from the view of other magical practices in pre-modern ones. Magic is a universal phenomenon. Every society in every age carries some system of belief in it. Every society has been there to claim the ability to harness the supernatural powers behind it. Even today, magic so, subtly prevails our lives. There must have chance to wear to exams or interviews. Others nod at large, low magpies to ward off bad luck. Iceland has a government recognised elf whisperer who claims the ability to see, speak to, negotiate with supernatural creatures still believed to live in Icelandic. Iceland's landscape. Well, so that today you, we might write this off as an overactive imagination. Or just... wait, 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 overactive imagination. Of stuff of fantasy. The medieval period magic was only accepted by real, real, very real. A spell or charm would change a person's life, some for the worse, or some for the curses, but equally not, if not more often, for the better. Magic was understood to be capable of doing a range of things, marvellous and surprising, mundane. Mundane magic spells were in many ways little more than at all. A use of not finding lost subjects to buy love, predict the future, heal illness, and discover buried treasure. In this way, magic provided solutions to everyday problems, essentially problems that could be solved without, through other means. Before he was only counted as moral dismissive, a priest by church, and unless magic was caused to, uh, used to harm cause harm, for example, attempted murder, the church was not especially concerned. Once it was simply treated as a form of superstition. The church did not have the authority to read out corporal punishments. Magic was normally punished by fines or extreme cases, public and stint and preparatory. This might sound Tertullian today, but these punishments were far lighter than welded up by secular courts, while maiming execution were an option even from minor crimes. Magic, then, was placed low on the list of priorities for law officers, meaning it could be practiced free, readily freely, if with a degree of caution. Along with the found hundreds of cases of magic used for birds in Lincoln's essential law, court records, there are a number of testimonies claiming that spells were effective. In the 13th 75, the magician John Jesse boasted he recovered £16 for a man from Galerix. Meanwhile, Alice Hancock claimed she could heal people by blessing the clothes, or if the patient was a child, concerned him with fairies. She did not explain why fairies could be inclined to help children. Through the court's the, through the court's disapproval, proved she ordered to stop her spells at risk of being charged for hearsay, while with a, a, a cap, which was a capital offence. Angus testimony shows that her parents were normally satisfied. Patients were normally satisfied. As far as we know, she did not appear before the courts again. Young, old, and rich and poor alike use magic. Far from being the preserve of lower classes, it was commissioned by even most powerful, very powerful people. Sometimes even by the royal family to have a case in 1390. Duke Edwin of Langley, the son of Edward III, an uncle to Richard II, is recorded as having paid a magician, ma- magician 
to help him locate some stolen silver dishes. Meanwhile, Alice Peters, mistress of Edward III in the fourteenth century, was one to have employed a fire to cast love spells on the king. Though Alice was a diversive character, use of love magic, like using it to find stolen goods, was probably not surprising. Eleanor Coleman, Duchess Goldtissa, also famously employed a cunning woman to perform love magic in 1441. In this case, it helped conceive a child. As use of magic pot got her out of hand, however, and she was accused of also using it on Henry the V.I.'s death. In many ways, magic was very much part of everyday life. Perhaps not something that one openly admit to using. After all, if you're officially seen as immoral, but still treated as something of an open secret, a bit like a drug you like used today, magic was more common enough for people to know where to find it. The use it was certainly recognised being frowned upon. As for the people who magic, often terms cunning folk, though service musicians that they treated the knowledge skill as a commodity. They knew its value and the skill of science and stations inhabited a marginal space between being tolerated and necessarily shunned as they were sold. As the medieval period faded in the early modern belief in diabolical witchcraft grew when stronger line was taken against magic, both the courts and the Mukhanomji culture, it was main widespread throughout and still survives in society today.